week of Advent is joy. And as I was kind of gathering my notes for this, I stumbled upon and realized that this is the third time I have been called to talk on joy during <laughs> Advent. You know, in the long history of kingship, and that's a long time. Um, and it, it might be coincidence, but I know the real reason why I'm always asked to do this. It's because I radiate joy 24 seven, right? There it is, you're welcome, all right? You need joy, come to me. And there are some people in here that don't agree with that because there's a lot of you in here that know that that is not the case, right? Not 24 seven, so that's not exactly true. But what is 24 seven in this season alone is the reminders of joy that we see everywhere. During the Christmas season, you don't have to walk very far into any store or even drive through a neighborhood where you can see the words joy or Mary, you know, just on there. They're big red letters. They're, they can be hanging from the ceiling. They're plastered on the walls. You know, they're wrapped in lights and put up on a house, like enshrining the house in joy. Like this house is joyful. We are joyful people here. There's joy ornaments. There's joy Christmas decor. There's joy songs. There's joy clothing. There is joy multitude of things. It is everywhere. But they're all things for us to consume or take in just to remember to be joyful. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, we should, be, we should remember to be joyful during times like this. After all, this season is very busy. It can be challenging. You know, there's a lot of things to do. Um, but what's funny, if you think about it, we take all those ornaments, decor, those things that say joy, we put them in a box, we put it in the attic, and we're like, all right, filled with joy, right? I got it all for the next 11 months. I am good to go. But there is some truth to why we do that as humans, why, why we, put, we take little things and uh, we put it away like, oh, no, we're good. I'm good. I'm full of joy. But we, we only need things later to fill up our joy again. Things like food or this cupcake, right? That looks delicious, right? There's nothing like having a cupcake when it's been you're sad or you've had a long day just to bite into that chocolate and just get the frosting all over your face, right? Maybe you can taste it right now. Or, or things like uh, the, the, the latest gadget, you know, or clothing. I, I just, I could use that as a distraction, right? I can play these games and just re be happy. And, or I, this, this piece of clothing that I'm wearing, you know, it just makes me feel so good and joyful. I look good in it. It helps me relax. I mean, I, I deserve this because, one, one I work hard, and it's, it should be mine. It, it will make me happy. I just want to relax. And then there's a rare occasion that happens. And on rare occasions, some people find joy in stealing other people's cell phones and proceeding to take hundreds of selfies on it only for that person to find it later. It's pretty clear that there is joy in this photo, right? <laughs> that person may be here today. But, and I will admit that I did find joy in finding that. But we move on because we all struggle uh, to find joy in wrong places. We're desperately trying to find true joy that it does ultimately exist. It is out there. It's just not in the things we try to fill it with, where we try to fill our life with joy. So where is true joy? Now, if you've been to Sunday school, you can cue up the answer. True joy, I heard it, yeah? True joy, and the answer is Jesus, right? But the joy of Jesus is different. The surprising testimony of the Gospels is that Jesus was a man of unparalleled and unshakable joy. And this, this season, uh, Rick has talked about, and me tonight, the, the theme is the visible image. And by visible, we don't always mean to be seen. We also mean by visible, uh, like the physical nature of it. Because any woman in this room that has had a baby knows the presence of the baby that's inside them. And the remarkable thing about Jesus's joy, this true joy, that it was even felt before he was, quote unquote, visible, right, to the, to the naked eye. And from the, the womb, we see the ripple effect of this joy, and it, it actually caused another baby in a womb to leap with joy. So in Luke 1, 
which we've been reading, says this. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country to a town in Judah. Now, this was right after uh, Mary got the news that she was going to have a son. And she entered into the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So Jesus, before he was this visible image to the world, he was already demonstrating and sharing this joy that he later is promising that he would give us. So from the womb, from the beginning, all the way to the cross, Jesus wanted us to have joy. And that's why the author of Hebrews can say this in Hebrews 12. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So let me get this straight. I don't know if you saw that. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. That doesn't make sense. So Jesus endured the most difficult, the most shameful, the least righteous, most unfitting anguish ever to anybody. And it will or ever will happen to anybody. And he did so with joy in tow. That doesn't make sense. So right there, the joy of Jesus is definitely different. But you can say to yourself, it is, it's, it's easy for Jesus to be joyful, right? He's I am. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end, the alpha, the omega. I mean, he's a king. He has all authority. And for goodness sakes, he defeated death. Right? It would be easy to have joy to be Jesus. But here's the deal. There's actually nothing easy about it. And to understand this joy that he has and that he brings and wants to give to us, you have to understand this. You have to understand the man of sorrows. Right? Probably didn't see that coming. Because what a name, right? The man of sorrows. It sounds like a terrible comic villain like name, like a Batman villain, right? But this isn't a villain at all. It's the, the man of sorrows is Jesus. Now, the prophet Isaiah wrote one of the most profound prophecies uh, written about the coming Messiah. And it was titled, The Suffering Servant. And then some 700 years later, during New Testament times, we know that the suffering servant is not only the Messiah, but God himself. It was God's own son who, can, who came to rescue his people by receiving in him himself the justice they deserved. So just a snippet from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem, esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. So how can God himself the happiest being in the universe, not only become man, but he chose to become a man of sorrows? Why would he do that? Well, well it's right there. He, he borne our griefs, and he carried our sorrows. Jesus came for us. Jesus came to earth on a mission to, to save us. He not only entered into our flesh and blood, but into our sorrows. And those include the sorrows that we may be feeling today. He took those sorrows and he nailed them to the cross, along with his own sorrows. Jesus was so much more than a man of sorrows, although he was described as that. Ultimately, he was sustained by something much deeper. He was a man of something much stronger. Now, Jesus could have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows had he not been buoyed or anchored by something deeper or more enduring, and that was a deep, habitual joy. Uh, Dallas Willard is one of my favorite philosophers, theologian, and he was asked about joy. And when I heard this quote or read it, it just is one of those things that just burns into your brain like a brand, right? It stuck with me 
and it still sticks with me, and this is what he says. Joy is not a passing sensation of pleasure, but a pervasive sense of well-being. A pervasive or extensive or a widespread sense of well-being. So in other words, joy is a sense of well-being regardless of circumstances. This is the type of joy that sustained Jesus. And he kept sharing that and showing it to his disciples and the, his, uh, the followers. Theologian, theologian Donald McLeod once said in regard of Jesus, a joyless life would have been a sinful life. And we all know Jesus didn't sin. So he definitely had joy. So the topic of joy and rejo- rejoicing, uh, rejoicing is something that Jesus talked about more than we think. Now the Gospels... Um, uh, they, they, they do focus a lot on the objective and external aspects of his ministry, um, and we do get a precious peek, but we do get a precious peek into the deep, habitual joy that is Jesus. And it starts, again, at the very beginning, at the birth. In Luke 2, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, if you need proof that Jesus is joy, then it's right there, right? Because the word joy used here is in the noun form. And the angel could have announced the human arrival as, I bring you good news of the great king, or good news of the great savior, or good news of the Messiah. No, he chose to introduce Jesus as great joy, And after that was established, the very next sentence, then he goes into all the King, Savior, Lord stuff, mentioning all that. And later down the the line, we also see Jesus' own joy when he makes himself the shepherd in the parable of the lost sheep. And when he had found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Isn't that great? Heaven erupts in joy. We also get a double glimpse of this joy that Jesus is sharing in Luke 10. And he first is challenging some joy that these people are having, a group of people that return return with joy because they're so happy that they were able to cast out demons. And Jesus follows that with Jesus talking about where true joy should actually come from. And that's in Luke 10. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to, to whom the Son chooses to reveal. Now, I want you to hold on to something for just a little bit, and it's right up top there, and it's where Jesus said he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Jesus makes sure to point out where the rejoicing should be pointed. To not rejoice in the ministry fruit that is yours, but in the Father who has made you his. The joy that fed and sustained Jesus himself, it was not the sermons he gave. It wasn't the sick that he healed, and it wasn't even the dead that he raised, but it was the relationship that he had with his father. The bottom of his joy was not what he did in the world, but whose he was. And that's enforced by in scripture many times. Things like he delights in being a child of his father. Another one, he delights in childlike 
dependence. And then he delights in receiving from his father and being known by his father and knowing his father and bringing others into knowing his father. He was the living embodiment of Psalm 16. And here is just a snippet of that. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now we could keep going, but at this point I want to go back to the man of sorrows. Because we talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, joy isn't about being happy all the time. It doesn't mean that we ignore any anguish or sorrow that we are experiencing. Because after all, Jesus... He, he didn't ignore, ignore those things. He didn't ignore those things because of the pervasive sense of well-being that Dallas Willard talked about. Jesus, he walked the path of disobedience or of obedience towards the gates of hell himself, not by mere duty, but to fulfill his calling with no less heart that he would expect his followers to do, any one of us. Go back to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah writes this further down in that same chapter. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted, for, accounted righteous, and, and he shall bear their iniquities. Yes, anguish and sorrow are real. We experience it. Right there, what Isaiah said, but the satisfying sight, he, he could see and be satisfied. The, the satisfying sight beyond the pain that lay before Jesus sustained him through Calvary. And we see this again at the Last Supper. When, when, when we see the anguish and joy that held him as he strengthened his own soul and as he prepared his men. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. So it would be true for his men because it was true for Jesus first. Sorrow would turn into joy. He would endure anguish for joy and not for a passing sensation of pleasure, but for, for a joy that no one could take away. And this is something that the early church understood so well. As they, as they were spreading the good news, going out, spreading the good news that, the risen, that Jesus is the risen king of the world, they were persecuted. But as Acts say, they were still filled with joy. Paul, too, writes about joy, but he's, also, he's writing about joy from a Roman prison. He says, even in hardship, I choose joy, saying things as, as, as I'm sorrowful, yet I'm always rejoicing. It's that deep understanding of the visible joy that Jesus portrayed. So yes, it is safe to say that the joy of Jesus is very different. That's why the author of Hebrews can even write that line, for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. I mean, could you guys do that? Would you even want to do that? I mean, just look at his last day alone. He, the agonies of being betrayed by a friend, then being denied by another friend multiple times. He was tried by corrupt rulers. He was scourged by godless soldiers, and he was crucified in public. Would, would joy sustain you through that? I think it depends on the joy you're consuming. And here's the beauty of it. Jesus is giving us his joy. Jesus gives his own joy. And those of us who call ourselves his people, 
how for a second can we not look at this book and realize the joy in Jesus and not explode with significance for everyday life? And that's true for myself. This thing has instructions like, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Rejoice that your name, names are written in heaven. Jesus is no hypocrite when he tells us to rejoice. He is the man of joys, drawing us into his own. He wants our joy to be full. And, and when we let ourselves be drawn into Jesus, let ourselves be drawn into the fullness of his joy, rejoicing in the midst of sorrow can be possible. Why? Because as Isaiah said, we can see and look forward to what is to come. Misery may love company, but the fullness of joy is even more contagious. And that's where I want to finish, wrap up today. I want to finish up with the most astounding claim Jesus makes about joy, which is, again, back on the night before he died. Jesus, ultimately, he didn't want to leave us with the scarcity of our own joy, but he rather, he wanted to leave us with his. He wants his joy to be ours, and that's very important. He doesn't want us just to have any joy. He wants us to have his joy. The very joy of the Son of God himself poured into our souls. He says this to us twice so we don't miss it. He first is talking to his disciples. And he says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now for Jesus to say this to his friends, to the people that know him best, that spent every day with him, how attractive would this joy must have been? Right? These guys were watching him teach and interact with people for three years. They must have saw a deep joy coming from Jesus. And it had to bring a smile to the face when he's saying, like, I'm giving you my joy. I'm giving you the same access to this joy that we have. I mean, if Jesus' general demeanor was more morose or somber, then there would be no appeal for Jesus saying that my joy may be in you. Right? The disciples have been like, awesome. Thanks, Jesus. We're really looking forward to that. Sweet. Yeah. No, it had to be something so captivating. Something the disciples would have, they, they would have witnessed it and they would have desired it. I mean, how, when you're around someone, it's, you're like, wow, you're so joyful. Right? It's contagious. Jesus would have been displaying this all over the place. That's the reason why he's saying this. And just a short time later, Jesus is in prayer to his father, and he says, But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus, as the visible image, he was revealing the true joy of the invisible God. He is showing us how joyful God really is. John Piper um, wrote this, Christ not only offers himself as the divine object of my joy, but pours his capacity for joy into me so that I can enjoy him with the very joy of God. Back to the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he is so satisfied and reliant in the Holy Spirit that he embraces the greatest anguish. And now wonder of all wonders, he not only wants us to be happy, he is pouring his joy into us. And Jesus offers us the same access to this joy as John the Baptist. Rick has taught earlier that even in the womb, John was filled with the Spirit. He had the Spirit. And we read in the beginning, and when Mary greeted Elizabeth, John's mom, she was filled with the Spirit. So you have this, when the spirit gets near the visible image, Jesus, it's going to freak out. It's going to leap with joy in the womb, even though it's two babies in a womb next to each other. Um, 
when I read through these things, just reflecting on all this, it reminds me of what Jesus says of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes what is his and makes it known to us. So the Holy Spirit can take this joy that, is, that Jesus is pouring out and make it known to us. It's quite literally a translator. It's translating this joy that Jesus has to us. I don't know if you've seen these translators these days. That they're pocket versions or it could be on your phone. You can speak anything into it and it outpours so someone else in a different language can understand you. You can say whatever you want, just instant, just like that. You know, but there's an action that has to take place when we do this. We have to actually speak into it for someone else to understand it. Right? We have to ask the question or what we're trying to do so it can answer out. So we have to ask the Holy Spirit about this joy. If you want this joy, ask about it. Do it. See where Jesus takes you. I'm, t- I'm talking to myself up here. <laughs> I'm not just preaching to you guys because I radiate joy 24-7, right? But just it's important to be, whose joy are you relying on? Are you reaching out and grabbing onto that joy that Jesus is offering? Ask about it. Do it and see where Jesus takes you. Because looking at all this, this joy that is found in Christ, that's the, that's the joy we should all be focusing on and looking at during this season and the next 11 months, and then the next years, and then the years and decades, focusing on a deep, sustained joy regardless of circumstance to imitate Christ, to receive the joy that he is handing out. Now, there's nothing wrong with the joy that things, those things I mentioned earlier, bring to us. Stuff in the world can be beautiful and moving. I mean, after all, it's God's creation. But they lack the very thing that Jesus talks about a lot, and that's the ability to make your joy full. Jesus' joy is the only one that can make you full so we can endure a life of ups and downs so that we can see beyond the pain and be satisfied. There's a song saying during this season, joy to the world. And when we sing it, it's easy, it's joy to the world, you know, right? It really is, it's joy to the world. Jesus is giving us and wants us to have his remarkable joy.